Professor Khalid Saeed, Professor Maurya, Professor Amina Kishore, Professor Kidwai, Khalid Masood, Om Prakash, Govind, Shagufta, and dear colleagues in the pursuit for which we have gathered here today. This is actually not my first visit to the university, but it is my first visit to this campus. I'm extremely pleased to come here and to see that one of the special objects of the Hyderabad landscape, the great, gigantic, world-famous rocks are still standing in this campus. I congratulate the university on the wisdom to retain that wealth <laughs> for future generations. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to speak at the inauguration of this seminar, but I am in somewhat of a quandary about exactly what to say since there is going to be a keynote address to follow my speech. I hope, therefore, that you will not find fault with the things I say, but believe that I say them by way of encouragement to everyone who's come here with a paper to present or merely to participate in the discussions that follow. Ladies and gentlemen of literary occupations and preoccupations, I speak to you not as an expert in the theme of the present conference, but as someone who is most definitely involved in numerous areas subsumed by its title. As someone who has taught for long and is still teaching the English language, whatever that term may mean in the present context, as someone who has taught English literature, British literature, American literature, as well as some Canadian and Australian literature. As someone who has written about these literatures in books and articles. As someone who has, at professional refresher courses, taught teachers who work in these fields. As someone who has written and published original poetry in English, as someone who has for decades directed and, and produced considerable student drama in English, though in a variety of English as you will see, both original drama in English such as Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream and Arthur Miller's All My Sons, and drama translated into English from say Latin, such as Plautus Menikmi, and from Marathi, such as Silence, the court is in session. And I speak here as someone who has translated a considerable number of literary texts of many kinds from Marathi into English and in the reverse direction also, and some biographies. Indeed, Perhaps because I happen to be so deeply embroiled in the domain, the organizers of the conference felt they must invite me to speak here today, for which I will remain eternally grateful. At any rate, my involvement in these various fields and subfields of what they call native and non-native literature in English is my passport to the conference, and it affords me the liberty of speaking upon some of the diverse areas the theme of the conference subsumes. Therefore, I speak as a genuine insider who is also an outsider. However, right at the outset of the conference, it is imperative that I share with you what Professor Amina Kishore has already hinted at. I, uh, I'm happy to hear what she had to say. Uh, a fundamental doubt regarding such terminology and such categorization. 
You see, I'm not at all sure that everyone present here would like to be caught constructing phrases such as the arrival and recognition of non-native English literatures in the English world that forms part of the description of the conference theme. That phrasing was necessitated, and I also hope that you will forgive me for saying so, by an honest yet serious confusion at the core of the subject of our conference. For despite the fact that in what is universally labeled the global context today, English dominates as international language as it has never done before. I'm quite unwilling to call today's world the English world. There was a time, perhaps, when at the height of the British Empire, the imperialists may have been tempted to use a phrase like the English world. What sets today's world apart from that world is precisely the opposite phenomenon, that far too many other cultures and nations have emerged out of pre-modern shadows and come into their own to make it a multicultural and multinational world that is most certainly not the English world. Believe me, I do understand the motivation for the search for a name to subsume all the elements in the phenomenon we are to study over these two days. But whether the opposition of the terms native and non-native will serve our purpose is in serious doubt. As a dig or poke in the ribs of the British people, perhaps a momentary adoption of such phraseology may appeal to us. That is to say, calling them native for a change may satisfy a slight ironic urge in us. But juxtaposition of the expressions native English literature and non-native English literature is fraught with difficulties, not only because the term English literature is itself erroneous and justifiably resented by, say, the Welsh people, the Scottish and the Irish people within the domain that we call Britain. Nor do all the difficulties of these terms arise from the fact that both terms encompass or subsume phenomena that are far too diverse and widespread for such presumed cohesive naming. It's not difficult to see why we require a set of terms for such a purpose. Naming is not only magical, it is also convenient. But included in the term native literature in English is the literature of the British Isles, but then there is also the literature in English that has been being written for over three centuries in some other areas of the globe and for nearly two centuries in other large areas of the globe. Now, the first question to emerge is this. Are the British Isles the only place or nation that produces native literature in English? Don't the United States of America, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa, for instance, also produce native literature in English. If we put the populations and writing of all these countries together, it is doubtful whether this mass will either be small enough to justify the single description native literature in English or cohesive enough today in content to validate the term native. But the English of these nations is just as native in our sense as the English of the British Isles. On the other hand, one must also consider literature being composed and published in English, not just in places such as India, but also in remote and geographically, historically, culturally, politically, economically, biologically, environmentally, and demographically diverse areas of the globe, such as Nagaland and Meghalaya within India, and Nigeria and Fiji abroad. These are regions of India of which hardly any mainland Indians think in terms of Indian literature, let alone including them in the category of non-native Indian English literature. In some countries or regions, the English language has become the official and national means of communication, as in numerous Caribbean islands. In some other countries like India, it's presumed 
that a large number of people know and use the language, yet the number still remains in the low single digits in percentage of the general population. Of these scores of different communities, only a few claim English as their language. In others, it is either a foreign language still or distinctly a second language because its cultural content and life are not localized adequately to justify the use of the description, their language. As though this were not enough, the literary histories of these communities are far too diverse and variously brief or extended over several millennia to recommend general clubbing together. With almost purely oral to highly literate histories, these communities naturally mix local and shall we say English traditions, conventions, forms, and devices, just as they mix utterly non-native environments, kinship, and other social frameworks, food, raiment, customs, and political and economic aspirations and conflicts that bear no resemblance at all to any native English societies and literatures. We must also take into account the significant cultural linguistic alteration that is occurring especially in countries such as the United States and Australia. And yet, as the explanation of the conference theme tells us with some justification, the unending popularity of English, this is their phrasing, continues in well over 100 different countries in addition to its expressive flexibility which fascinates even its vociferous opponents. That popularity or impression of the capabilities of English is in itself undeniable in both literary and non-literary social domains in countries like India, despite the fact that not all the countries in which literature is produced in English were once colonized by Britain. South Africa is a classic example. Despite the long, concerted, and even blood-stained efforts of Thomas Hardy's drummer Hodge and his compatriots, the British managed to colonize South Africa only in a very limited measure. The two Boer Wars made it clear that the territory would never be a British colony. But what does it mean that English has expressive flexibility and fascinates even its vociferous opponents? Does it mean that English has such abilities and local native languages don't? Does it mean that English has these capabilities in greater measure than local languages? Does it mean that in the 20th century, these capabilities were more appropriate for the historical context than those of local languages? Does it mean that literature in local languages was inferior to literature in English? The answer to all these questions would be obvious even to unpatriotic citizens of these hundreds of countries. All these questions must be answered in the negative. No language, no society, no culture is inferior to any other, nor are any people inferior to any other. All things being equal, the literature of any society, whether exclusively oral or both oral and written, can be as good, as moving, and as powerful as that of any other language. No human society is devoid of a long history of oral literature, for that is the mainstay of its cultural, civilizational, historical transmission down millennia. So what do non-native writers gain by writing in English? For hardly any of them is compelled to write in English. Indeed, this subject has always given rise to discussions and even acrimonious dispute in all such countries where, in fact, English remains a foreign or second language. A commercial motive is at times attributed to those who write in English as opposed to their own local languages. They are supposed to have access to the worldwide English-speaking reading audience. That is, of course, patently untrue. At times, the small minority of their populations who writes in English is suspected of being Anglophile, and the achievements of such writers is usually considered inferior to the achievements of writers in local languages, and their motives are routinely suspected even today. 
I must say that as far as I've been able to ascertain the validity of such claims, in general, there is truth in them. With just a handful of exceptions, only very recently have writers from such countries begun to command wide respect in what the conference description calls the English world. But whether the award of a Booker Prize, for instance, elevates an entire non-native English literature to a native English level is a moot question. Why do writers in countries with numerous proud and long literary histories write in English? Generally, the English language has become superficially naturalized in their societies. There is and can be a local motivation as well that such countries themselves tend to be seriously multicultural and multilingual and with no genuine national language or one which is in fact not the language of even the majority of their populations. It is a historical accident that in India, beyond their other local languages, people didn't so much take to writing in Hindi as by and large to writing in English instead. They found a wider audience across vast language and literature communities within India when they wrote in English. There is no reason indeed why in such circumstances good literature cannot emerge. Whether that requires a long historical preparation, whether there is a sort of gestation or incubation period, or whether the language command needs to achieve a certain degree of naturalness for success are questions worth exploring, and perhaps you will explore them. One thing that has been attributed to recent writers in English in India uh, is their non-bookish, non-cliched, non-derivative, and idiomatic command of the English language. Another is their ability to represent or reflect local issues, lifestyles, and circumstances interestingly and within the general parameters of the native English language. In translation as cultural politics, Lawrence Venuti makes an extreme proposal that any Englishman translating from any non-English language does violence to the original text and the culture. Whether we accept his inflexible and grossly overgeneralized proposition as a valid representation of the activity of translation, I leave to you to consider. But he proposes two terms that might be useful for us, though superficially they are slightly contradictory sounding. A translated literature which seeks to accommodate and fit the local subject matter into the cultural and linguistic constraints of what may be considered native English. That's one category. And that translated literature which succeeds in creatively modifying and expanding the resources of native English to accommodate non-native contents, which is the second type of translation. The first one he calls domesticating translation, which is uh, like um, converting the local content into a uh, native language uh, situation, or in his words, to bring the work to the reader. But there is another and much more difficult kind of translation that brings the reader to the work, and that he calls foreignizing. In translating in India into English in particular, Everyone has to choose between whether to domesticate or foreignize, or how much to domesticate and how much to foreignize, and language choices depend on these decisions. These things happen within our languages also, as those of you who have translated within India will also recognize. A very special category of non-native literature in English is translation into one or another subtype of native English. I believe that if one were to direct a translated work strictly, say, to Australian readership, then the language of translation will have to subject itself to strictly local patterns of uh, what we call the Australian idiom. However, contrary to what many people believe, there actually is a vast and solid core of the language that is common to all native varieties of English. One may choose to translate a non-English work into that core native variety, 
or English, and not in any particular sub-variety of it. That's what most translators in India are doing at present. There are some serious exceptions as well. The second thing about translating into English in particular is that the translated work may be called new, an altogether new work. Sujit Mukherjee first called it uh, by this name in 1994 in his book, Translation as Discovery. However, I see a contradiction, a tension between the term discovery and the term new. You discover what is already there, and new means what you have given uh, life to for the first time. So whether the term new is good enough for uh, our purposes is uh, something you can decide. Now this also raises the always important, but in the present context especially hairy question of readership of literature written in native as opposed to non-native English. A non-native writer may very well succeed in writing in native English. Several have, of late, done exactly that, rare though such a phenomenon may be. Similarly, we must ask who is expected to read a work in non-native English. If I write a novel, who's going to be my readership? An English-knowing audience within a local language community may be the first readership of writing in non-native English. Next, as I have already indicated, an audience across many languages within the uh, country uh, that we, uh, like India, for example, uh, Hindi speakers reading my English novel. I have not written an English novel. Let me make that uh, clear uh, yet. It's only an example. And it's only then that a work may go beyond the boundaries of one country and have a readership in the larger world. These are concentric circles, but widening circles. And very, very few people have audiences beyond the first or the innermost circle. The publishing industry, of course, contributes to how uh, well-read a book will be if it appears on uh, foreign uh, television channels, is likely to be read elsewhere, and of course, distribution and reviewing machineries also contribute to this. Incidentally, such phenomena exist in other languages as well. English is only one of them. Portuguese is one, Spanish is another, and French is a third major language of that kind. The next uh, more recently named phenomenon of uh, non-native writing in English is uh, diasporic writing. Of late, uh, there have been numerous conferences in India on uh, diasporic writing. Um, diasporic writers have received awards. They have come to India and read their work to audiences or spoken about uh, their work. And uh, of course, it has begun to form part of the curriculum of several departments of English in the country. However, we have to ask the question, how old is this phenomenon? Our written work of literature affects an audience. Ladies and gentlemen, I place before you today some of my thinking regarding the subject set out for our conference. I have indicated that I have serious reservations regarding the essential concepts and terminology used in the context, and I have indicated what I consider some of the important areas of the field of the conference that must be explored for a better understanding of it. There are questions of sources of literature, whether they are local or topical, whether they are deliberately chosen because uh, they may be eye-catching for foreign audiences, for instance, whether writing in English is dereliction of duty or irresponsibility towards one's native or mother tongue. One of my teachers once accused me of betraying my mother tongue by not writing in it. And he said, you must write in your mother tongue. Well, I asked him, if I also wrote in my mother tongue, who will be left to read what people write in my mother tongue? 
<laughs> Writing requires leadership also. I must also admit that my teacher's little poke or barb moved me to write an article on the same subject in my mother tongue, which he published in his journal. As you can see, everything's all right in this world, as long as we are reasonable about what we discuss or quarrel about. Now, <clears throat> whether we plagiarize a little bit from time to time, whether we copy somebody's style, and so on, those are questions that we must really ask. The one thing that mustn't happen, and I've skipped over one or two paragraphs in my speech, because I'm sure you're looking forward to participants' presentations, uh, whether you like it or not, literature that you write in any language, including English, will be judged. It'll be judged by reviewers, it'll be judged by readers, it'll be judged by critics and teachers and students all over the place. So we need to be quite conscious of how works are likely to be judged. A hundred such questions will naturally arise from the very provocative topic of the co uh, conference that the Department of English at the university has set out for us. No one can notice or attend to every question. On the other hand, no one can dodge some of the fundamental and essential queries I place before you today and others will place before you also. Nor can one completely omit such questions from one's dealings with students either in a classroom or in more personal contact with research students. One will be justified, I believe, even in asking why one ought not to employ the far clearer and simpler terms English literature, meaning literature in native English, and literature in English, meaning non-native literature in English. It's just a proposal. You don't have to think seriously about it if you don't wish to. Therefore, I can only say that if I succeeded in broaching even a few worthwhile questions and conundrums, if some of them happen to be taken up directly or indirectly in the present conference in papers and discussions, I will have fulfilled some of the obligation of an inaugural speech. Thank you very much.